delighting Amen. in God on the elevated pathway. And uh, our dear sister, or our dear brother, actually, I was thinking it was going to be somebody else, but our, our dear brother very nicely read out this verse earlier, Psalms 37.4. Uh, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. What does it mean to delight ourselves in the Lord? We're going to have a look at some ideas about this tonight. And I'm going to start in, in, in what may be considered an unusual place. But let's see if uh, this, this passage of Scripture in Exodus is familiar to you. Verses uh, 2 and 3 of chapter 20. I am the Lord thy God, which has brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. What, what, what is this passage of Scripture known as? So it's the first commandment. And, and uh, as you'll see more um, when I said that nothing between my soul and the Saviour was the perfect hymn, then thou shalt have no other gods before me. Nothing between, nothing else in the way of a relationship with God. And if you study your, study your Bible, you'll find that the land of Egypt refers to sin. And the house of bondage is the bondage to sin. And, and it reminded me earlier, and this, this isn't in the study, but you'll be very familiar, I'm sure, with John 8, 34, which says, Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And servant of the in the Greek is doulos, which really means a slave. So if you commit sin, you're the slave of sin, according to Jesus' own words. And that verse, I believe, should be considered whenever, whenever looking at Romans 7, particularly from verse 14 on, which talks about the sin that dwells in me, um, sold under sin. Uh, it wasn't me that did it, but it was sin that, that's in me. And that's because that man that Paul was describing uh, was under the slave master, under the slave master called sin. And so uh, very, very, uh, very interesting passage that, that um, he helps us know that that's something we, we must get rid of. It also reminds me of the old Western that says this town ain't big enough for the two of us. Well, we we want the, uh, the the sheriff with the white hat in in our uh, in our temple, not the other one. And this is very interesting in First uh, John five, twenty and twenty one. Uh, and we know that the Son of God is come, and hath given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true. And this, of course, is referring to the Father. And we are in him that is true, even in his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. And John puts what I think is referred to in verse 3 of Exodus 20. Little children, keep yourself from idols. In other words, have no other gods before God. Have nothing else whatsoever before God. And uh, Matthew 22, 37 to 38 puts it this way. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. So it's much easier to have nothing in the way of God when you love him with all your heart and with all your soul. Soul is another word for life. And with all your mind. That's why throughout the Bible here and there, we're, we're uh, told this should be the case with us. 
uh, very interesting back in Jeremiah. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters and that spreadeth out her roots in the river and shall not see when heat cometh, but her leaf shall be green and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. Now you go and ask any farmer and they are very careful. They'll tell you we're very careful in the year of drought. Now, why is it saying that we, because this is what this little part of the passage is describing, us as trees, we shall not be careful of, of in the year of drought. And that's because when you're trusting in the Lord and we and whose hope the Lord is, he supplies all of our needs, no matter what the external conditions are. Amen. We don't have to be careful in the year of drought. And because of that relationship with him, we'll just never cease from yielding fruit. And whether that's the fruit of sharing the gospel with others or the fruit of, of advancement in our own character, in our own character development, um, as, as somebody said before, uh, to be in his image. Um, you may have heard of the Puritans, but just a little introduction because they, they were asked a very important question and made a statement in response, which, which is really excellent. So who were the Puritans? The Puritans believed that the Bible was God's true word, and that it provided a plan for living. The established church of the day, and this is back in the 15 and 1600s, described access to God as monastic and possible only within the confines of church authority. We would all disagree with that, as did the Puritans. The Puritans stripped away the traditions and formalities of Christianity, which had been slowly building up throughout the previous centuries. Theirs was an attempt to purify the church and their own lives. Amen. So what was the question? When asked about the first commandment, the Puritans made this important statement about God. Let's have a look at it now. We are to know and acknowledge God as the only true God and our God and to worship and glorify him accordingly by thinking, meditating, remembering, highly esteeming, honouring, adoring, choosing, loving, desiring, fearing of him, believing him, trusting, hoping, delighting, rejoicing in him, being zealous for him, calling upon him, giving all praise and thanks and yielding all obedience and submission to him with the whole man, being careful in all things to please him and sorrowful when in anything he is offended and walking humbly with him. Amen. Wow. What a big amen. amen. Now, may, maybe we could have come up with some sort of statement if, if, if we sat down long enough, but those brains they had four or five hundred years ago were, we've uh, had a decline, I think, in that in that uh, in that brain power uh, well i don't want to talk for anybody else here <laughs> maybe it's just me uh, but this bears repeating and i'd like to repeat it in the form of a question and in the first person let's have a look while walking on the elevated pathway should my focus be on knowing and acknowledging God to be the only true God and my God and to worship and glorify him accordingly by thinking, meditating, remembering, highly esteeming, honouring, adoring, choosing, loving, desiring, fearing of him, believing him, trusting, hoping, delighting, rejoicing in him, being zealous for him, calling upon him, 
giving all praise and thanks and yielding all obedience and submission to him with the whole man, being careful in all things to please him and sorrowful when in anything he is offended and walking humbly with him. So I hope your answer is the same as mine to that important question. Indeed. Indeed. Amen. 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 Indeed. So moving right along, Colossians 2, 6 and 7. As you have therefore received Jesus Christ the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. What a verse. Why have I highlighted abounding there in thanksgiving? Because I am personally guilty of not giving enough thanks to God. Abounding. It's not, not just saying um, giving th thanksgiving. It's abounding therein with thanksgiving. And abounding gives us this idea of, 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 of a much greater, much greater, um, way of giving thanksgiving. When you think about what this is saying, uh, and I could ask the question, have you received Christ Jesus the Lord and walking in him? Are you rooted and built up in him? And because of that experience, you're established in the faith that we've been taught. And of course, abounding therein with thanksgiving. We need to be giving thanks. Well, again, I need to be giving thanks more and more and more to God, abounding with thanksgiving. And has he also done this for you? Ezekiel 36, 26 and 27. A new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Just before moving on to verse 27, and a new spirit will I put within you. Now, some think that that's the Lord's, Lord's own spirit. But what it's saying, he's going to not only give you a new heart, but renew your spirit. How do we know that? We just have to keep reading our Bible because after that experience, he says, and once all that's done, and I will put my spirit within you. And cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. Can we walk in God's statutes and keep his judgments and do them without his spirit in us? Impossible. Some of you might have tried it like I have. And the other thing to re remember about this, uh, is this is what I call the heavenly heart transplant. A new heart also, also shall I give you. No such thing as a do-it-yourself heart transplant. It's the job of the heavenly surgeon. Amen. Amen. Some some may have heard of, of this this uh, this man, A. W. Tozer. I'm not sharing this to promote him. I think some of his uh, doctrinal thinking would be different to ours. But he, he said something very important. And just a little bit of background on the man, and then we'll, we'll have a look at what he said. So he was born in, <coughs> pardon me, 1897 and lasted until 1963. At the time, and still is through his many, many books, uh, was a well-known evangelist in America. He had six boys and one girl. He and his wife, Ada, lived a, a simple and non-materialistic lifestyle. Even after becoming a well-known Christian author, Toza signed away much of his royalties to those that were in need. Prayer was of, vi of vital personal importance to Toza. His preaching, as well as his writings, were but extensions of his prayer life. He had the ability to make his listeners face themselves in the light of what God was saying to them. And these were comments from his biographer in the book, 
In Pursuit of God, The Life of A.W. Tozer. What did he say? Orthodox Christianity has fallen to its present low estate from lack of spiritual desire. Among the many who profess the Christian faith, notice it's Christians, not those in the world. Among the many who profess the Christian faith, scarcely one in a thousand reveals any passionate thirst for God. We fear extremes and shy away from too much ardor. What's ardor? Passion, enthusiasm, zeal, eagerness, dedication, commitment. Apparently, we shy away from too much ardor in religion. As if it were possible to have too much love or too much faith or too much holiness. Amazing to think about it. Yet, and I don't know where he got his stats from or where the one in one thousand one in a thousand came from, but if it's anywhere near true, and I wouldn't be surprised, I pray that everybody here will be part of that point zero one of a percent of Christianity, where we have a great passionate thirst for God. We don't fear extremes or shy away from too much ardor. And we know that it's impossible to have too much love or too much faith or too much holiness. Amen? Amen. So that's why sometimes we just need to examine ourselves. And we have this according to 2 Corinthians 13.5. Examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you except ye be reprobates. Now, very serious language. Hmm. And how do we know? You say, examine yourselves. Have an introspect. Have a look at yourself. Are you actually in the faith? And you got must prove it to yourselves. And you must know your own selves. How do you know that you're in the faith? Is that Jesus Christ is in you. And if he's not, what are you according to the Bible? Reprobates. What's a reprobate? We'll have a look at the Greek original language for that word. It's adokimus which means unapproved, that is rejected, by implication worthless, whether it's literal or moral. A castaway, rejected, reprobate. Now, I, I, I know for sure that nobody here, if I was asked you to put your hands up, those who want to be a reprobate, no hands. No hands. But you are not one. When you're in the faith, that is, Jesus Christ is in you. What a blessing. And then this one, First um, John 4, and we'll look at a few verses in this chapter. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Continuing. Hereby know ye the spirit of God, every spirit that confesses, that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth, <laughs> love that word, not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And if you thought reprobate was serious, what, what about this one? And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come and even now already is in the world. Mm. Now, unfortunately, some Christians will tell you that when it says Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, they say, oh, no, that means that Jesus Christ did come in the flesh. He came in human flesh 2,000 years ago. But that's not what John's saying. 
from the writing of these words, words decades after Jesus went back to heaven, they are, they are relevant and in present tense until Jesus comes the second time. Because he simply says, Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Now, how do we know for sure? Sometimes we just have to keep reading our Bible and the next very next verse confirms it. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them because what? Greater is he that is in you. Amen. Than he that is in the world. <laughs> Praise the Lord. This is just such a wonderful gift. No wonder. No wonder God is asking us to light to delight to delight ourselves in him. And this one, and we, we, we're coming to the close. And to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. So you, you, you say, what, to what extent is, is, is Christ in you? And according to, is it John 14, 23, the Father and the Son make their abode with you. To what extent? This is the extent that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Comprehend that if you dare. Filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. No wonder. Because it's according to the power that worketh in us. What power is that? All, here it is, there's the underlining. All the fullness of God. That to me is amazing. E e even incredible, even almost unbelievable. But praise the Lord, He said it. I believe it. It's true. You're filled with all the fullness of God. And closing with finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might.